Okay. So when we talk about the kidney, we talk about specifically the things that I look at are I'm going to look at the glomeruli, I'm going to look at the tubules and the interstitium and the blood vessels. I'm going to show you images of what these look like, specifically normal first, and then what abnormal looks like a lot in IG nephropathy. The reason we do this is because my daughter likes to watch these cartoons. They talk about teamwork being the dream work, guys. Every one of these components has to work together or things go wrong. If there's damage in the blood vessels, eventually it leads to damage in the glomeruli and the tubules. And the reverse is also true. If the tubules are damaged, eventually it leads to damage in the glomeruli and the blood vessels. Everything has to work together to actually do the job of filtering blood appropriately. All right. So I like to use this picture when I'm teaching the med students, when I'm teaching the residents. It's a nice cartoon showing that our glomerulus is this kind of sphere. It's this three-dimensional structure where small capillaries come in, wrap around themselves, and then leave. All right, and you have this little space where all of the, we call it ultrafiltrate, but basically the stuff that gets filtered from the plasma component of your blood comes out through here and eventually turns into urine that we get rid of. That's how we get rid of a lot of our waste extra electrolytes, extra fluid especially, and then also a lot of our drug metabolism. That's how we get rid of medications we take. So we, a lot of people think of the liver as doing that metabolism, but the big thing that the liver does is if the medication you take isn't water soluble, the liver will add something to it to make it water soluble, and eventually it's going to get filtered out and end up uh, within the urinary, uh, the urinary space, so to speak, go down through the bladder, and it exits through the urine, urine stream. So I like to just kind of go over this, explaining how this is when we take this nice little three-dimensional sphere, so to speak, and cut it in two dimensions. This is what it looks like to the pathologist. Okay. We have what we call this, this like, I guess you could say sheath around it. We call that Bowman's capsule, and it's lined by a certain cell. And then we have our capillary loops here, and we have mesangium. And we'll talk about mesangium because mesangium is very important in IGA. This is where the IgA actually deposits within your kidneys to then start the disease process. And what this is, it kind of acts like um, a filter to get rid of anything that clogs up these little pores here, so to speak, within the capillary tubes. Okay. So this is just showing a nice little red cell. Again, this is all just a cartoon. I'll show you what it actually looks like in a microscope in a moment here. And these are the cells. Endothelium is what we call them. They line blood vessels. All right. And they have these openings that the fluid specifically from the plasma component, can filter through and come through here. So this is what we call glomerular basement membrane, all right? And it's two cells smashing their cytoplasm against each other to make that filter. And whenever anything's wrong with that filter, you're going to start to see protein and blood in your urine, okay? So usually that's why a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, wants to get a biopsy because they know something's wrong with this barrier if there's protein or blood in your urine. And that's when they ask me to do my job and tell them exactly what is wrong, what disease process. All right. So what it actually looks like under the microscope, the glomerulus looks more like this, guys. Okay. And we have our arterioles or the small little capillaries that bring blood in and bring blood out. And then the whole capillary thing, we call it capillary tufts here. We have our basement membranes and blood is flowing through here. And then the filtrate comes out here. And this is what we call either urinary space or Bowman space. And again, eventually that goes to the tubules, lots of different ion exchange, fluid exchange happens, and it eventually turns into urine that we get rid of. Okay. This is, uh, to me, it is a very elegant, organic filter. You know, having been on dialysis, I'm sure Stuart knows a little bit about that. Nothing compares to this, guys. This is, this is just a wonderful, wonderful, elegant, organic filter. So when we talk about the glomerulus and normal glomerulus, we talk about these delicate ribbon-like glomerular basement membranes that form our capillary loops. There shouldn't be anything in them. Okay? Talk about the mesangium that the loops wrap around. We've got our Bowman's capsule here and that Bowman space or urinary space where the filter, where the fluid that's filtered out comes through and eventually becomes urine. So the next compartment, we talk about the tubules and the interstitium. These are the tubules, guys. So this is going to help resorb any electrolytes that we need to get back, any fluid that we need to get back, get rid of fluid we don't need, things of that nature. So they're very important as well. They're all back-to-back. -back. I like to use a phrase that one of the nephrologists here at Temple University uses, Dr. Chung. He says, in normal, they want to be back-to-back -back kissing each other. 
The interstitium is all of the volume of the kidney that's between the tubules. In a normal kidney, it should be very difficult to even identify interstitium. Once it becomes damaged, I can identify it very easily. But this is how normal looks. This is what you would hope your kidney looks like. Okay? And you would expect that this space between the tubules is very small and difficult to identify. This is what normal looks like, guys. All right, next off, the blood vessels. This is a nice blood vessel in a kidney. This is different from the capillaries. This is a little bit larger of an artery. You can see those cells that line it, similar to the capillaries, the endothelial cells. And they have smooth muscle cells and fibrous cells. These wrap around it to deal and hold the pressure that's coming through. So if there's damage here, sometimes these blood vessels can't handle the pressure, all right? We'll talk about some damage and what can go wrong in these blood vessels later on in my slideshow. So I said I was gonna talk a little bit about the stains that we use. The, the workhorse of pathology, we call it H and E, hematoxylin and eosin. Eosin's, they claim it's a red stain, they claim hematoxylin is a blue stain, but really guys, it's pink and purple. I mean, come on, this is pink and purple, it's not red and blue. Okay. So this we've used in pathology for 150 years. And it's great, but in renal disease, the ones that I really use the most are PAS, periodic acid shift. And that's because this gives me very good um, definition on the base of membranes. With the PAS thing, it's very easy for me to determine where mesangium begins and ends, where the capillary loops begin and end. The silver stain is similar to that. It's a pink and a black stain. The silver stain also lets me see certain features that PAS stain doesn't let me see. And the last one is trichrome. This is actually truly a red and blue stain, and I'm going to show you a good picture of this later on. This is very good for identifying that scarring, or sometimes we call it fibrosis of the kidney. Okay, I'll show you images of that. Okay, so I use all of these stains when I'm looking at the kidney to determine what the disease is and how severe the disease is. Okay, so now we're going to come to the MESTC score, the MESTC score. So IG nephropathy is usually a chronic progressive disease, but the problem is not a problem actually. Some patients never progress toward kidney failure. Very, very lucky. Some patients even have spontaneous regression of the disease. It just goes away. All right. Question is, how do you tell who's going to do what? All right. It's got many different features that we see under the microscope. And so the people that came up with this MESTC score wanted to know just looking under the microscope itself without any other um, clinical information, can we get an idea of who is gonna have a greater risk for needing dialysis in the future? And not only that, can we have an idea of how long before they'll need dialysis? Okay, so it's just a way for us to predict the risk for progression and estimate how much time. All right, and it is defined as uh, these, this, uh, slide just kind of defines what the each uh, acronym, what the acronym actually means. So M stands for mesangial hypercellularity, E for endocapillary hypercellularity, S for segmental sclerosis, T for tubular atrophy, interstitial fibrosis, C for crest information. I'm going to show you images and explain in further detail what it means when I say mesangial hypercellularity. Okay, so for the M score it's given a zero or a one, meaning we see this feature in either less than 50% of the glomeruli, which gives it a zero score, or more than 50%, which gives it a one score, all right? Endocapillary hypercellularity, we grade it on a zero to one, either it's absent or present, meaning none of the glomeruli show this feature, or at least one glomerulus shows this feature. If at least one glomerulus shows it, it gets a one. Same with segmental sclerosis. If at least one glomerulus shows that feature, it gets a one. And then tubular atrophy, interstitial fibrosis, we scored on a zero, one, or two. Zero meaning less than 25% of the kidney shows this feature. One meaning uh, a quarter to half shows this feature. And two meaning greater than half shows this feature. And then crest information, zero, one, or two, similar to T-score. Only this one is zero means there are no crescents, zero percent. And one means there's one to 25%, and two means greater than 25%. So typically, the way that the Renal Pathology Society recommends that we diagnose IgA going forward now is we don't just say IgA, we actually give it an MESTC score so that the nephrologist and hopefully the patient with this conversation with your nephrologist have an idea of what your risk for progression 
to end-stage kidney disease and need for dialysis is. All right. Now, I do get asked, how come, how come my biopsy doesn't have this MESTC score? The Oxford study that came up with this occurred in 2011. All right. If you had a biopsy before then, and it actually didn't really become standard procedure until about 2013, you had a biopsy before then, it's probably not going to have this score. If it does, it may not even have C score. This didn't come into play until about 2016. And again, didn't become standard until about 2017. So if you had a biopsy before this time, you may not see this. Okay. I wanna show you some pictures saying exactly what is mesangial hypercellularity. So I'm showing a normal glomerulus here. And remember I said mesangium is that area where the capillary loops wrap around. And the mesangium are these cells, sorry, that can get rid of anything that might clog up those capillaries, so to speak. Well, mesangial hypercellularity is there's too many cells within that mesangial compartment. Like right here, you can see this is normal. There should be three cells or less. In this one, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six cells through here. This is one of the hallmarks of IgA nephropathy. Usually if I see any of this in any biopsy, even before I get the immunofluorescence out, it's probably gonna be IgA nephropathy. Certain other diseases can look like this, but this is one of the first on my list when I see that. So any patient where I see this in here, what I then have to do, or that has IG nephropathy, I have to go and I have to count all their glomeruli and see if I can find this feature in any portion of the glomerulus and in how many of their glomeruli. It's more than 50% of their glomeruli, they get a score of M1. If it's less, they get a score of M0. There was one biopsy during residency where the, uh, Interventional radiologist gave me a lot of cores of tissue. There were 150 glomeruli for me to count. And I had to count every single one so I could give an accurate M score. That, was, that, that biopsy took like two hours to look through. All right, so when we say M score, we're gonna talk a little about, about this in more detail. M1, this patient on this right here has a higher risk of needing dialysis within 10 years than this patient here with an M score of zero. All right, next we're gonna talk about endocapillary hypercellularity. So again, going back to our normal glomerulus, you see how there's nothing within here. There's no cells. It looks beautiful and open. In this patient, we can see one, two, three, four cells within this capillary lumen right here. Same here, all right? Part of the disease process is it deposits within the mesangium and then these cells go haywire, so to speak. So if I see this feature in an IgA nephropathy patient biopsy, um, in an IgA nephropathy uh, patient, what's gonna happen is they get a score of E1. If I see it in at least just one glomerulus, it doesn't matter if like we can use that one uh, case of the patient with 150 glomeruli. If 149 looked like this, but number 150 looked like this, that patient has a score of E1, meaning they have a higher risk for needing dialysis in the future than this patient over here, okay? And also, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Usually, whenever you have a score of E1, the nephrologist is gonna wanna use immunosuppression, probably usually stronger than just corticosteroids that we use for the protein area. That's when they're gonna wanna use, like maybe they'll try rituximab or something else of that nature. Okay. All right, the next uh, feature is called segmental sclerosis. So what this means is this is where certain areas of the capillary tuft scar down and can even adhere to Bowman's capsule, that sheath around the glomerulus. Okay, so that's what this is showing here. You have somewhat normal appearance here and then the rest has scarred down, meaning this portion of the capillary tuft can't do its job of filtration. So again, if I see this in at least one glomerulus, that patient gets an S1 score, meaning they have a higher risk for needing dialysis in 10 years than this patient. Next one, we're gonna talk about tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis, or T-score. Here's normal tubules. Remember, like Dr. Chung says, back-to-back -back kissing each other. You can see this patient right here. This is the trichrome stain, guys. I showed you lovely red and blue. The blue highlights areas of fibrosis. Sometimes I refer to it as scar tissue. This portion of the kidney scarred down. This is chronic damage. It cannot be fixed, unfortunately. Okay? The tubules are shrunken. They're small. 
and the space between them is increased. Okay? Whereas over here, we have the tubules, they're not shrunken, and the space between them is not increased. This is somewhat normal here. This is abnormal. All right, this process, this is one of the worst processes in the kidney because once the scar tissue comes down, it can't be fixed, it can't be taken away. If I could figure out how to get rid of this, I'd probably win a Nobel Prize, guys. Um, and it wouldn't just be in kidney. Patients that have fibrotic damage in their liver and their lungs would be praising me for the end of days. Okay. So this is one of the features that is a worse feature out of all of the other features in any STC score. Next one is we talk about crescent formation. So this is what a crescent looks like. And it was named that way because it looks like a crescent moon. What's happening versus the normal glomerulus is this glomerulus is undergoing so much damage that those cells that line Bowman's capsule, they start to have, they start to react, they start to proliferate, and they start to try to fill up Bowman's space to try to stop the damage. Unfortunately, it's a maladaptive change. It ends up actually killing the glomerulus over time. So when we see this, this is actually considered a medical emergency. There's not a lot of things what are a medical emergency in my field of study, but when I see this, I normally have to give the nephrologist a heads up call immediately. And when the nephrologist sees this, this is when they use the much more heavy immunosuppressant. That's when they use like cytoxan or cyclophosphamide actually, and try to stop this process. Whatever's damaging the glomeruli, those strong immunosuppressants hopefully can stop this process. Okay, but again, as we can see, nice open Bowman space. The other word for that is urinary space. But here we've got these cells that are filling up and slowly crushing down this capillary tuck. Okay. So looking for all these features is what allows us to get an MESTC score. All right. And the reason we do this, and this is just one graph from many graphs that have been done, but just kind of show that on the y-axis here, Survival without the primary outcome. Primary outcome was defined as end-stage kidney disease. So in 10 years, somebody with M0 and all the other zeros and not a lot of proteinuria, their chance for needing dialysis is 10% or less. Okay? Because they have a 90, 91% chance of not needing dialysis at 10 years. Okay? Whereas when we look, when we start getting a higher MESTC score, all of a sudden on the blue line, their chance for not needing dialysis drops down to 73%. Or the other way to say that is at 10 years, they have a, 20, a greater than 25% chance of needing dialysis because of these features we see under the microscope. All right. And that's why the pathologist is, um, that's why the field has moved forward in this, that we can give the nephrologist and hopefully the patient a better idea of what's your time frame and manage expectations on, are you going to need dialysis? How long until you're going to need dialysis? With the understanding that the higher the score is, the, the greater the chance that you will need dialysis in a shorter amount of time. Okay. Next off, I want to talk a little bit about some of the blood vessel diseases. Because again, as you noticed in that MESTC score, it said nothing about the pre how well your arteries are. Okay. Some of the diseases that we talk about that affect blood vessels are arterio and arteriolosclerosis and hyalinosis. These are features we see in patients that have hypertension or diabetes. This is one of the reasons why if you see your kidney doctor, they're gonna constantly tell you, make sure you're taking your blood pressure medication. If you have diabetes, make sure to do your best to try to keep your blood sugar under control. Because as it damages uh, the blood vessels more, it's gonna to lead to more damage to the glomeruli, more damage to the tubules and interstitium. Inflammation, these are patients that can have like lupus or other types of autoimmune diseases as well. And also when we think about inflammation within the blood vessels, we think of transplant rejection. Sometimes necrosis, I'm gonna actually show you a picture of what it means to have the blood vessel necrosis. And necrosis means cell death, meaning the cells are dying. Okay. A lot of times we can see this in inflammatory states as well. Next off, thrombosis, AKA making blood clots. We can see this in something called thrombotic microangiopathy. I'm gonna explain that in a, in a slide in the future here. And then sometimes we talk about emboli. I don't see this much, but sometimes cholesterol emboli or things of that nature, patients that have had you know, heart attack or they have bad coronary artery disease, sorry, 
sometimes what will happen is when they try to open up that artery, it tears off some of that plaque that's in the arterial wall and that can shower down through the rest of the body system. Every now and then we'll see that. Sometimes there's other things that are emboli. I've seen it where a gunshot wound breaks bone and you can have bone fragments that are microscopic, fly around and stick around. That's just what emboli means, something that gets thrown down. Okay. What we're really going to talk about is we're really going to talk about blood clot formation, a little bit on necrosis here later on. Next slide, we're going to talk about what arterio and arteriolosclerosis looks like. Okay, so we have our normal blood vessel. I showed you guys that. With our nice opening where tons of blood can come through here, get all that oxygen to our tissues, it's lined by those endothelial cells, and it's got that nice fibrous and muscle cells allowing it to handle the pressure. Now, when it starts to have hypertension, when you start to have uh, a lot of pressure making these cells really work for it, they kind of work out a bit. And all of a sudden, this blood vessel, which should be all the way open from here, then lumen becomes this narrow. Okay, so instead of having 100% blood flow through this blood vessel, you now have 50% uh, or less. Okay? So this is one of the reasons why, again, if you have any kidney disease, and, and just in general, you want to try to limit the damage to these blood vessels. If you have hypertension, you want to take your blood pressure medications. If you have diabetes, you want to make sure to try your best. I know it's a struggle to keep your blood sugar within levels so that it doesn't damage your blood vessels. And AKA, decrease the amount of blood that can flow through any artery at a given second. This is what it looks like compared to normal. Nice and open. This thing, this opening should be all the way open from here to here, and it's not because this blood vessel has been damaged. In my opinion, looking at this, it's probably a combination of both diabetes and hypertension. Okay. So this blood vessel gets at least 50% less blood than it should. So you can imagine over time, that's gonna damage all the tissues surrounding it that need more oxygen. Okay. Now I use the term thrombotic microangiopathy. Sometimes we call it TMA. This is something that we've been asked to focus on now, especially in IG nephropathy biopsies. What this means is it's a group of disorders. They all look the same under the microscope, but what we see is small blood clots or thrombi within arterioles and capillaries. They call this, we see breaking apart of red blood cells. The term that they use is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Let me break that down for you. Microangio, small blood vessels, like capillaries. Hemolytic, meaning hemolysis or tearing apart of red cells and anemia, where all of a sudden, when they put the uh, needle in your arm to check your blood count, it's no, no, lower than normal because you're tearing apart your red blood cells. Okay. And then you also have decreased platelets. That's called thrombocytopenia. All right. A lot of times this is gonna lead to kidney damage. They call it acute renal failure. What can cause TMA? Lots of different things. Uh, if you have a transplant bio, if you have a tr kidney transplant, Rejection can cause TMA. Taking too much of your immunosuppression can cause TMA. There's lots of different other causes. But like I said, this has become a new focus in IG nephropathy. And I just want to explain that this is one of the other diseases we are asked to start looking out for. So one of the things that we see in TMA is onion skinning of the arteries is how we describe it. So here's our nice normal blood vessel. So what's happening is because of the damage to the blood vessels, all of a sudden these cells that line it, they swell and they start to close up. So this is a blood vessel, okay? So the question I normally ask the medical students or residents that I show this picture to is, how is the blood getting through this blood vessel? Where's the opening for it? Okay, this one is completely closed off, so no blood is getting through here. There's been so much damage to this blood vessel, it's completely closed off, right? And this one here, this is where the lumen is right here. So it should be all the way open. So now it's like less than 10% of blood can flow through with this blood vessel at any second. And this is what we call onion skinning. You see those layers, right? All of this damage, it has started to swell up and close to try to protect itself. And this is a very, very big problem. There, I told you there's not many uh, causes or emergency situations in my field. This is another emergency situation. If I see this on a biopsy, I have to call the nephrologist and let them know. Because if this is happening in the kidneys, it's potentially happening throughout all the body. Anywhere where there's small capillary beds, in the lungs, in the brain, I have to call them and let them know for them to make sure. 
it can be limited to just the kidneys, but you know, I can't take that risk. I don't know. So the other thing that we talked about is necrosis or cell death of the artery wall. Again, take a look at our normal artery here. This is another artery. And I like to describe the arteries a lot of times as like straws, right? So you can imagine the straw, if the wall were actually made of, instead of the plastic, if it were made of jello, how long do you think it could handle the pressure of the, blood, of the heart pushing the blood through the body? Probably couldn't handle it very well at all. This is what you're seeing here. Instead of those nice fibromuscular cells here surrounding it to handle the pressure, they're dead. It looks like my daughter took a pink crayon and just kind of smudged all through here instead of these nice layers right through here. Okay. This artery right here can't handle any of that pressure. So sooner or later, this is going to either break and it's going to spill blood everywhere here. And then it's like putting a hole in a straw. How well can you get fluid through a, through a straw when you've got a hole in it? It's very tough, right? So anything that's supplied by this blood vessel is probably not going to get blood and oxygen to it anymore. So this is one of the issues that we see. Here's another one of those onion skinning vessels. Here's another one of those problems that we see in patients with TMA. So this is one of the focus that we've been asked to start making sure that we know when we look at these biopsies and these IJ patients, making sure that this process isn't happening. This also is a worsening risk for needing dialysis earlier. Okay, so when I talked about thrombi or blood clots within the, with, within the glomeruli, this is what I'm talking about. Here's our nice normal glomerulus I've showed you guys a couple times now. Here's our Jones stain. I told you guys it's pink and black. And you can see here's a blood clot right here. Okay. This is that arterial leading into the glomerulus. And once this blood's here, no more blood can get through until you like either bust that up somehow, the body has ways to get rid of blood clots, or you try and stop whatever the process is that's causing it. So you can imagine if it's blocked up, you, this glomerulus can't filter like it's supposed to anymore. Okay. This is a huge problem. Like I said, this is one of the reasons why I immediately have to call the nephrologist and make sure that uh, this situation isn't happening in their lungs or maybe even their head. Yeah. So the last, so th these are some of the things that hopefully, hopefully you don't have these, but if you see them talking about arteriosclerosis on your biopsy, MESTC score, this is what they mean. And the question sometimes that I get asked is, well, I already have a biopsy diagnosing IgA nephropathy. Why do I need another biopsy? Why do they want another biopsy? The big reason is the nephrologist is seeing some change. Either your creatinine is now rising or there's worsening proteinuria. And a lot of times they're concerned that the MESTC score is no longer what it was from your previous biopsy. Maybe you had a T score of zero and now they're worried maybe it's going to be one or hopefully not two. The other thing is they could be concerned something else is going wrong. Maybe they're concerned that you're starting to have a TMA, right? And they need to check it and make sure that they can uh, stop this process and save your kidneys. Okay. So um, these are the reasons why nephrologists might say, I want another biopsy because all of a sudden I don't, I think that your risk for needing dialysis is worse or it's going to happen at a sooner time. And that's going to conclude my uh, my talk, guys. I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity. I'm I'm willing to take any questions for however much longer we have. Uh, thanks, Dr. Hassel. We do have a couple of questions from the uh, audience. Okay. The first one is, um, what is an acceptable number of glomeruli in a sample to have a good biopsy review indicative of kidney state? That's that's a great question. Okay, so the Renal Pathology Society has decided that for light microscopy. For what you're seeing here, this is light microscopy, you need to have at least 10 glomeruli to get an accurate assessment of what's going on. All right. Now, again, I told you guys that had one that had 150 glomeruli. Generally, it's accepted that, pay, that everybody walking around that has two kidneys has about a million, of, a million glomeruli in those two kidneys. Okay. So getting 10, getting even 150 usually is not much of an issue at first. All right, so 10 is what we like to, like to, that's like the bare minimum. If I don't get 10, I can still diagnose, but some of these things aren't considered completely accurate. Uh, is, uh, that a good, is that a good enough answer? Yeah. I think to be, yeah, I think so. Uh, next, we have a question. Can MEST scores ever improve, or is it the best possible outcome for them to be stable? 
That's a great question. Um, in my experience, it can happen in those rare patients where the disease regresses, where it just goes away. I've only heard about it. I've never seen it, but I've only been doing this for about four years. Usually, MESTC score either stays stable throughout the rest of the patient's life or it worsens. Okay. And again, I'm not trying to make any kind of doom and gloom. I just want to help you understand and start to manage expectations. Uh, we have another question about MEST scores. What MEST score has the best prognosis other than zero all over? Uh, E1, and that's it. Um, that's a great question as well. So which one has the best score? So let me tell you the ones with the, the ones with that are considered the worst implication. T score is considered the worst implication. The higher the T score, the worse, because there's nothing they can do about this. It's chronic scar tissue that's laid down. S score is also considered chronic scar tissue. You cannot fix that. Now, technically, yes, I've taken the glomerulus out of the patient to look at it. So there, you'll never fix that glomerulus. But in general, um, the S score is also considered scar tissue that cannot be fixed. Okay? So the best one besides all zeros is considered to be E1 or M1. E1, they usually will give a little bit of that immunosuppressant and usually it has a better prognosis. Um, here's a question um, from the audience, but I'd be interested in the answer as well. So this person had a biopsy done in 2005. Can they request their MEST score now? Um, that would have to have a, a you would have to take the biopsy, uh, the slides, and have another review. Although usually, I have to say, again, I don't know what your biopsy says. I do not just state a diagnosis on the diagnosis I put out. I have something called a microscopic description where I explain what I see under the microscope that led me to my diagnosis. So if you have a microscopic description, it should state how many glomeruli have what features and we can actually derive an MESTC score from that. But other than that, that uh, reviewing the slides themselves or seeing what they wrote for a microscopic description, that's the only way I could know to, to have one that happened before the MESTC score came about. Um, the hospital system I use states details on the biopsy, no scores. Is it acceptable to ask for the scoring? Uh, when was, when was, does it say when the biopsy was done? I mean, it's always yeah. acceptable to ask for more information, in my opinion, but they, they, I can't guarantee that they'll be able to get it. Yeah, the biopsy was done last year. Okay, so um, I would have to say, yeah, it's, it's acceptable to ask for that score. I mean, it's now the standard of care that when you look at kidney biopsies, especially that have a diagnosis of IgA, this is, this is now standard of care that you need to give that. Sometimes, I will say this, not every person that's looking at it went through a renal pathology fellowship like I did. Some of these guys have been around for, guys and girls, have been around for a long time. Um, so maybe they're not, a, not up to date on that or whatnot, but I think it's appropriate to ask for one, okay? And I would start that conversation with your nephrologist and have your nephrologist ask for it. They usually have an easier inroad to get the pathologist to do what they want than, than the patient does. Um, a question also, do crescents ever repair themselves? So yes, crescents do repair themselves if they are treated. If they're not treated, they completely destroy the glomerulus over time. Now, again, like I said, this, you know, this crescent, technically this glomerulus, I've pulled it out of the patient to look at it. So that, you know, it's not gonna fix itself, but we actually classify crescents as either cellular, where there's lots of cells, or fibrocellular, where there's cells and fibrous tissue, scar tissue, or just straight up fibrous, where it's just scar tissue. If it's just fibrous, you can't fix it. Okay, that scar tissue's down, that glomerulus is slowly gonna dis be destroyed over time. If it's fibrocellular or cellular, you can fix that with treatment. And like I said, usually it's cytoxan. I think the other term for that is cyclophosphamide. It is a very, very strong immunosuppressant. It's got side effects and this and that, but it will stop this process most of the time. IgA is not the only disease where you can see crescent formation. There are multiple other diseases that do this. 
What does intimal fibroelastosis on arteries mean? Intimal fibroelastosis on arteries is basically arteriosclerosis. They may grade it as mild, moderate, or severe. And then I don't know how most people like to label that. For me, mild is there's only 20% reduction. Moderate is there's 30 or 40% reduction. And for me, severe is there's more than 50% reduction. But that's, some of the pathologists can have a different version of that. And when I say reduction, I mean mild would be just a little bit of the lumen is narrowed. And when I say lumen, I mean the opening where blood can flow through. Um, how long does it usually take for MEST sore to worsen? For example, how long can it take for a segmental sclerosis of X percent to get higher? Um, so again, segmental sclerosis, we grade on it's either absent in all glomeruli that we see, or it's present in at least one. Um, it basically, I don't know that I can completely answer that question. IgA can have moments of what we call flaring, where all of a sudden, um, it seems to kind of progress really quickly and then slow down a bit. A lot of times it seems like the, the nephrologists that I've talked to and in my own experience, uh, when patients get like pretty sick, especially with another upper respiratory tract infection, that's when it seems like IgA kind of worsens a little bit and then goes away. The vast majority of patients, for me, it's probably the same, had some type of upper respiratory inf tract infection and then later on they get diagnosed with IgA nephrology. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hasser. It's been great information. I wish I had had some of this information before one of my five uh, biopsies that I had done. It would have, would have been very helpful. And we appreciate your time tonight, and it's been a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, um, if there are any other questions, you can forward them to Carrie or someone else. She can forward them to me. I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability, guys. I appreciate the time, and I appreciate having an opportunity to explain explain what I do. Great, thank you so much. Uh, next up is our um, Sparkler sponsor, Chinook, who's gonna be here to talk about some of the transplant information on their clinical trials that's now in process. Hi, Stuart, can you hear me? We can, Paige. Okay, uh, it looks like my computer's thinking about presenting. It might take a minute for us to actually connect here. It's trying to. No problem. Take your time. Yeah, let me know when you see it. You got it. Okay. Okay, I think you're um, okay. Pretty close. There you go. You're in good shape. Great. And so, Stuart, do you see just the single slide now? Yep. Yep. You're, okay. You're ready to go, Paige. Yep. All right. Super. Thanks so much. Well, no we love the, the theme of your meeting, Spark. Um, and so it had us thinking a little bit. So if, if Spark is a byproduct of fire, where's the fire? Um, it seems to be within you. Uh, patients, families, caregivers, providers, uh, you've built the fire and called attention to IgA nephropathy. Chinook Therapeutics hopes to be a part of providing additional fuel to help keep that fire blazing and be a source of hope and commitment to finding better answers for kidney diseases. Thank you for inviting us to be a part of your meeting. My name is Paige Ellison. I'm the Director of Clinical Operations at Chinook Therapeutics. There are three other members of the Chinook team you'll be meeting this evening as we move through our talk. Uh, we're particularly excited to be uh, excited and grateful to be a part of uh, this venue uh, in that it, it's enabling a real dialogue with you. Um, I so appreciated watching the patient comments and, and questions come up as Dr. Hassel was speaking. Um, and I, I encourage you to do the same for, for our talk um, to, so that we can answer any questions that you might have as we go along. So our intention tonight is to talk to you a little bit about the drug development process, to tell you a little bit about our company and what we're trying to do, inform you about Atrocentin and our Align study, and make time to hear from you. So please feel free to comment through the chat function. 
So I'd like to introduce you to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Alan Glicklick, who will share with you some recent changes that have helped make way for drug development for kidney disease, as well as for the inception of our company. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting the Chinook team to present uh, this evening. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of update on what has been going on in drug development for kidney disease. Um, over the past few decades and more recently. So I think the first point here is something that, that the people in the audience here know better than anyone else. There's a tremendous unmet need for new medicines for patients with kidney disease. There have been very few drugs approved in the past uh, two decades, despite the fact that there are approximately 37 million people in the US with kidney disease and as a country, we spend about $100 billion a year treating the complications and the consequences of kidney disease. So fortunately, over the past several decades, we've also gained a better understanding of the biology of the kidney, how the kidney works, and how disease processes in the kidney work. So we've, through that, we've developed some more tools to understand kidney disease better, and to understand what's really important in treating kidney disease. And for example, uh, in patients with IgA nephropathy, we've learned that reducing the amount of protein in the urine improves outcomes in the kidneys. So that's been one of the key things that's been learned. And recently, re regulatory agencies like the FDA in the US have agreed that um, reducing the amount of protein in the urine is an acceptable endpoint to get uh, new, new medicines approved for the treatment of IgA nephropathy. And that's a big change and it's really increased the interest in, in uh, developing new medicines for uh, kidney disease and IgA nephropathy in general. So just a little bit more about, about who we are at Chinook. We're, Chinook is a relatively small company that was just formed in 2019 just entirely focused on developing precision medicines for patients with kidney disease. And I'm gonna to talk to you in a few minutes a little bit more about atrocentin, our first drug for the treatment of IgA nephropathy. But we also um, are combining forces with another company called Arduro Biosciences. And we're gonna have a second drug for treatment of IgA nephropathy that's a little less far along, a little earlier in the development pathway. So we'll, the next time we talk to you, hopefully we can talk about two different medicines with possibly and hopefully complementary but different mechanisms by which we can we hope to be able to treat um, IgA nephropathy and improve the lives of patients with IgA nephropathy. So I'm going to turn it over now to Gerilyn, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how the drug discovery and development process works. Great, thanks, Alan, and good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, my name is Gerlyn Tolentino. I'm Associate Director of Clinical Operations at Chinook. And now that um, Alan has provided a brief introduction to Chinook and our pipeline of um, potential therapies for kidney disease, um, I wanna take you on the drug development journey with me to help show you how Chinook and other companies developing drugs like Chinook got to where we are. Um, so many of you might be familiar with this process already, so please bear with me, but for those who are unfamiliar, um, we'll do a high-level review of the work that goes into bringing new therapies like atrocentin to IgA nephropathy patients. Um, so this slide here is my favorite slide. It represents an exciting climb um, on the path to achieving regulatory approval, which is at the very top of the mountain here. Um, but before we get there, the process starts at the bottom of the mountain in a lab where the discovery of a target and that target is usually um, a protein that's associated with a particular disease. Um, the challenge is to identify how the target is relevant to the disease, confirm its role in the disease process and develop a compound that affects the target in a way that is expected to alter the disease. And we refer to this as a hit. And if a hit is made, we can conduct to um, 
uh, we can proceed to conduct preclinical research where we gather safety data in the laboratory um, and then from patients through clinical trials. Um, a lot of data is collected through this process so that regulatory agencies can review and determine whether the drug is safe, effective, and can be approved for patient use. Um, you know, it, they, they say that it takes an average of um, 14 years of research to bring a drug to market. So it's a very long but rewarding climb to the top of the mountain. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. This slide here details the four phases of um, clinical trials, starting with phase one trials. Um, where the drug is tested for the first time in a small group of people. And so usually these are healthy volunteers to evaluate if a drug is safe and find a safe dosing range and track side effects before a decision is made to continue with phase two trials where the drug is tested in a larger group of patients. Um, and in phase two, we continue to gather the same type of safety data from our phase one trials, but in addition, we want to see how well the drug works um, in patients and narrow in on the right dose. And then, so now if the data in our, in our phase two trials show that the drug is safe and effective, we, we have more confidence and we move into phase three trials where we continue to test the drug in an even larger group of people um, to confirm that the drug works and is safe when compared to um, commonly used treatment. And this is the phase that the ALIGN trial is at. We're um, going to be testing atrocentin in 320 IgA nephropathy patients all over the world. And um, Alan will speak more to um, the details of the trial uh, later in his talk. Um, so lastly, we have our phase four clinical trials here that take place after the drug is approved for marketing. And it gathers um, additional safety and efficacy data, some benefits and risks, and also pharmacoeconomic data. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So I know that COVID-19 has shed a lot of light on clinical trials. And so you may hear more about clinical trials now more than ever. Um, this slide here provides an overview of the clinical trial process. Um, I know that for some who have not participated in clinical trials before, the thought of participating in clinical trials seems super scary. Um, but I want to talk through how sponsors like Chinook keep the safety of our patients in mind through the clinical trial process. So the clinical trial process starts off with designing the clinical trial to make sure that we enroll the right patients, um, collect accurate and reliable data to be able to measure the safety and effectiveness of the drug. So this is another way of um, saying how well the drug works. Um, in designing clinical trials, we also need to balance good science while maintaining a feasible study design that mean, minimizes patient burden, um, but always with the patient safety in mind. And Paige will speak more um, about how we at Chinook find this balance later in the presentation. Um, so next, we file an application with um, regulatory authorities such as the FDA to let them know that we're planning to start a clinical trial. Um, this application contains data from initial studies and information about how the drug was manufactured. Uh, we also include information about our plans for the current clinical trial. Um, after we notify our regulatory authorities, we go through a very careful and thorough um, process to select the right clinical trial sites. So these are your hospitals, your nephrology clinics, specialty clinical trial units, um, site selection is, is a really critical and important step um, because we want to make sure that we're picking sites that have experienced staff, suitable equipment, the right facilities, and the patients that we need to make a clinical trial successful. And so we're currently at this step at Chinook. Um, we're in the process of reaching out to various sites all over the world to gain some preliminary information schedule a phone call to learn more about the site and their experience in clinical trials. And then we'll schedule an interview um, to tour the facility, 
um, review more of, of their experience during um, the visit and meet the staff. Um, so before a clinical trial can begin seeing patients, um, there is an institutional review board or an ethics committee that needs to review the clinical trial protocol to make sure that clinical trials are conducted ethically and that the benefits of participating in a clinical trial outweigh the risk. Um, and that patients are provided with accurate information to help them make an educated decision to participate in clinical trials or not. So those recruitment materials that you see, those have been vetted to institutional review boards to make sure that they don't contain any kind of coercive information. Um, and their main focus is the protection of clinical trial subjects. So now after the IRB approves the study and our clinical trial sites have been selected and have received all the appropriate training, then the fund begins and all the recruitment activities can start. Our sites can begin enrolling patients in clinical trials. Um, our so phase three trials, like the Align trial, can go on for many, many years, but until the last patient um, in the study completes their visit. But once a clinical trial is complete, uh, we analyze all of the data that we've collected to see if the drug works and review the safety of the drug before an application is submitted to regulatory agencies seeking their approval to market the drug to patients. So now the, the data in the, in the application um, uh, includes the safety and efficacy data that we've collected throughout the clinical trial process and from clinical and, and from preclinical studies, um, data describing how the drug behaves in the body and information describing the manufacturing process because they wanna know that the, that the drug was um, manufactured uh, correctly. Um, regulatory authorities um, review this information and, and they all conduct some on-site inspections of clinical trial sites and drug manufacturing facilities before issuing approval or not. Um, so that's the clinical trial process in a nutshell. Um, what I've presented is a super simplistic representation of the clinical trial process and, and you know, you get a false that things happen beautifully and in this nice sequence. Um, but in reality, you know, activities are going in parallel. We encounter setbacks and challenges. Um, but Paige and Megan will speak later um, uh, that, that uh, regarding some strategies, you know, that require us to adapt and implement different strategies to overcome these challenges. And, and we have some um, exciting technologies that we're implementing in response to COVID-19 um, to help mitigate that. Um, but now I, I'd like to turn it back to Alan, who will share more about Etrocentin, how it's been studied, and why we're using it for IgA nephropathy. Okay, great. Thank you, Jerilyn. So Etrocentin is an investigational drug to treat IgA nephropathy. Um, it's a drug that blocks uh, something in the body called endothelin. And there are certain diseases like IgA nephropathy and diabetic kidney disease in which the kidney produces too much endothelin. And these high levels of endothelin can increase the pressure within the kidney, causing damage to the kidney, and also increase inflammation and ultimately scarring in the kidney. So some of the things that Dr. Hassler showed you earlier on the on the on the biopsies, are the inflammation and scarring are, are one of the causes of that are high levels of endothelin. And the purpose of our ALIGN study is to test whether atrocetin helps prevent uh, progressive kidney damage by blocking the uh, substance called endothelin. One thing, uh, we do already know quite a bit about atrocetin. It's been studied in over 5,300 patients with diabetic kidney disease and improved outcomes in those patients. So, so what are the things, some of the things that we know about atrocentin? Some of the benefits that we know are that it, it's been shown to lower the amount of protein in, in the urine, which as we said, as I said earlier, is important to preserving the function of the kidney. Reducing the protein in the urine definitely is something that protects the kidney. And that, so by doing that, it slows down the loss of kidney function. And in fact, in a study in patients with diabetic kidney disease, 
it decreased by 35% the risk of developing kidney failure. Like all medications, atrocentin can have side effects. Um, one of the side effects is uh, buildup of fluid in the, in the legs or, or swelling in the legs or fluid retention in general. So that's something that for people that are in the study needs to be monitored. We also know that atrocentin um, and drugs like it can cause harm to a developing fetus. So women who have the potential of getting pregnant have to use uh, adequate birth control when they participate in the study. We also know that uh, it could decrease the sperm count in men and possibly make it harder to father a child later on. So just a little bit more about the ALIGN study. So this is, I, so Gerilyn just described the, uh, the phases of clinical trials. This is a phase three study. So this is the, the, the study that's done before we, we seek regulatory approval for the drug. And it's gonna be a global study of about 320 patients from 20 countries and importantly, including the US. So patients that, that meet the uh, inclusion criteria get uh, randomized either to get atrocentin or a matching placebo. And neither the, the patient in the study, the, the study doctor or the company knows in advance, knows during the study whether each, per, each person has gotten the atrocentin or placebo. A couple of the important criteria for, get, for entering the study are you have to be an adult at least 18 years old. Um, and there has to have been a biopsy at some time in the past with a diagnosis of IgA nephropathy. You also, the patients also have to have an adequate amount of pro protein in the urine. We know that the one, the people that have more protein, like more than a gram of urine in a you know, 24 hour uh, urine sample have more risk of progression of the disease. So those are the ones that we wanna focus on for this study. And patients also need to just keep taking the other medications prescribed their by their nephrologist. And that usually includes an ACE inhibitor or an ARB medication that most patients that have uh, IG nephropathy, especially the ones that have a, a, a lot of protein in the urine would be on already. So the study will last for approximately two and a half years. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Kate, who's gonna tell us some of the things that we've learned from patients to make the study a, a better design. Great. So in March of this year, Chinook, uh, several members of the Chinook team met with IgA nephropathy patients and listened hard as they shared their journey. We learned a lot during that conversation. And some of the things I'd like to share that with you, and I, I think I might recognize a name or two. Um, uh, some of you may have been actually on our patient advisory board, so I appreciate um, seeing you here tonight. So most people expressed um, experiencing a long path to diagnosis requiring multiple doctors and multiple visits. Once diagnosed, patients found little information about IgA nephropathy and few resources to either help learn more or for help in dealing with the diagnosis. Many people expressed that they had a continuous need to educate their own healthcare providers, including their nephrologists, who may not be IgA nephropathy ex experts. Most patients said their quality of life was significantly impacted by symptoms such as fatigue, shortness of breath, and nausea. Some patients experienced an inability to complete everyday tasks such as going to work, housework, and even socializing. For many, their mental health suffered because the disease and the treatment side effects and, and, and just general frustration with a lack of solutions that worked for them. 
All of that said, the patients that we heard from were finding ways to live with the disease, adapting their lifestyles and making choices to work around their symptoms. So despite the challenges of IgA nephropathy, patients were leading productive lives. We were very inspired by the resilience we heard in their voices and the enthusiasm, enthusiasm they had for the possibilities that clinical trials now offer. So before we met with our patient advisors, the Chinook team was very busy designing a study. So we care a lot about patients. We have family and friends and we ourselves are affected by disease. So as scientists and doctors and other professionals, we put our heads together to design the best trials we can. When we initially designed a line, we focused on what needed to be done to meet the regulatory needs and demonstrate whether atrocentin is safe and effective uh, as a treatment for IgA nephropathy. So when we brought our study to our patient advisors and they heard that we were going to require 19 clinic visits and possibly 21 more for women of childbearing potential, they said, way too many. We're busy, life is hard enough. So in other words, we didn't strike the right balance uh, the first draft of our protocol. So we got back to work. So with our patients and our caregivers top of mind, our priority remains patient safety. Sponsors must keep patients safe and do the things that will show that investigational that the investigational drugs that they're studying work or they don't work. For our patients who are already burdened with disease, can we make trial participation easier? We think we can. So from our patient advisors, we learned that patients want more information about clinical trials. We and other sponsors are reaching out to patient networks, participating in meetings like these, designing websites and materials for patients to explain more about clinical trials and to get information about trials in front of people who are looking for that information. Chinook will continue to find opportunities to broadcast more about clinical trials in general, and we hope this presentation is a good start. We learned that patients may need additional support in order to participate in clinical trials. So to alleviate some of the burdens of participation, we will help support patients with things like travel needs and offer some compensation for patients for visits that require things like 24-hour urine collection, which is particularly burdensome. To minimize clinic visits, we're allowing for home health, to come to patients' homes and are coupling that with telemedicine visits with a, stock, with a uh, study doctor. Women will not be required to go to clinic for pregnancy testing, but can do them at home. And so depending on what makes sense for the patient and for the study doctor, you could have as few as three clinic visits or as many as 19, if that's your preference for the, for the Align study. To minimize information collected, we're taking care to collect only what is needed to help us understand patient safety and whether atrocentin is making patients better or worse. We don't yet know the best way to keep patients informed about the study while it's in progress without jeopardizing results, but we want you to know that we're working on that and we would like your ideas. And then to help patients better understand genetic testing, we're including a variety of information in patient materials and in consent forms. And for the ALIGN study, we've made genetic testing optional. So if patients don't understand what we're trying to do or don't wanna participate in genetic testing, but do wanna participate in the rest of the study, they can. And about that little 24-hour urine container you see over here, um, one of the things that our patient uh, advisors uh, advised us um, was to find a way to camouflage that. And so this is kind of what we're thinking. So we recognize that trial participation will remain a significant commitment for patients and their caregivers, but thanks to patient input and involvement, we hope we've struck, struck a better balance. So to tell you more about the specifics of the ALIGN study, I'd like to introduce you to our Director of Clinical Trial Management, Megan Myers-Hummel. All right, thank you, Paige. Um, so, uh, and, and thanks to um, the organization and all the audience uh, for inviting us to present to you tonight. Um, as Paige mentioned, my name is Megan Myers-Hummel and I'm the Director of Clinical Trial Management. 
So this is going to be a very busy slide. So while Paige uh, loads up the animation one by one, um, you can begin to see the activities that happen during the various stages of the study. So before, before anyone joins a clinical trial, there is a period where patients need to take time to learn about the study and what is required of them if they decide to participate. This involves um, working with the physician and the study team to ensure all questions are answered, the risks and benefits of participating are explained and understood, and that folks have a chance to talk to family and friends about their decision about whether they want to participate. And th this is called, this whole thing is called the informed consent process. Uh, so if the decision is made to participate, then a form is signed by the participant and uh, the, the physician, uh, it's signed by the participant and the physician, and this form serves as documentation of this informed consent process. And then there's a screening period during which several assessments and procedures are performed to see if the patient qualifies for the study. I want to point out uh, that for our study, the ALIGN study, um, a biopsy is not required for entry into the study as long as uh, there was a biopsy done in the past and it confirms um, the presence of IgA nephropathy. Um, and also, um, you heard Dr. Hassel talk a lot about immunosuppressive. In our study, um, as a general rule, um, um, immunosuppressives are not are not allowed. Um, so uh, we we allow 28 days uh, during for the screening period. Um, many people will not need that much time to complete all the assessments, but we do allow we do have that wider window just in case. Um, many of the assessments and procedures that are required during the screening period are the same or similar to what would be done during a regular visit with your nephrologist. But there are some tests that are specifically for the study. For example, uh, we require two 24-hour urine collections to be done within about 14 days of each other towards the end of that 28-day um, screening period. Um, we also, and, and the results from those 24-hour urines will serve as sort of the baseline, like where, where, where were you when you started on the study? And then we'll look at the 24-hour urines throughout the study to, to see what happens with protein in the urine. Um, an electrocardiogram will be done uh, during the screening period. And um, all women of childbearing potential uh, will be required to um, start oral contraception if they're not already using an, another acceptable method of birth control. And if all the eligibility criteria look good, patients will be randomized. And randomization um, here is like the flip of a coin. And as Alan mentioned, no one on the study team or within Chinook Therapeutics or the patient has any control over um, how the patients will be randomized. So it's truly random. About half the patients will be randomized to receive atrocentin, and about half will be randomized to receive the placebo. And then we're off to the races in the study treatment period. And the treatment several visits over the two and, a, two and a half year period, as has been described. The visits can be done either remotely or in person. Um, and, you know, I just want to say that because of COVID, it's been really exciting to explore the possibilities of breaking out of the traditional mold of clinical trials, which before the COVID era were conducted almost exclusively in the physician's office or clinic. Um, and of course, Patients and physicians can discuss and decide what the best plan is for an individual patient in terms of the, the mix of in-clinic and, and remote visits, what works for them. Anyway, the treatment period um, involves many of the same assessments and procedures that are listed for the screening period, plus a few others that are specific to the trial. For example, um, patients will periodically uh, be required to complete quality of life questionnaires. We want to track how how you're how you're feeling throughout the study. Um, they'll they'll be required to record their weights a few times early in the study, and make daily recordings of when they take the study drug. 
Uh, patients will continue their normal dose of ACE inhibitors or ARB. And of particular importance, uh, women of childbearing potential will need to have the monthly pregnancy test to make sure they are not pregnant before they can continue with the study drug. And both men and women will receive ongoing counseling about birth control and other lifestyle considerations. And these, these other considerations include uh, avoiding, uh, for example, a super high protein diet or very strenuous ex exercise before lab draws and 24 hour urine collections because uh, that can affect the results of those tests. And speaking of 24 hour urine collection, um, in addition to the two that are required during the screening period, there are several more required in the treatment period. And why is that? <laughs> That's because the FDA is going to look at the amount of protein in the urine and, and how it behaves over the course of the study. Our theory is that atrocentin will decrease the amount of protein in the urine over time, and this surrogate endpoint that was mentioned by Alan might show that atrocentin can prevent progressive kidney damage. So the urine and blood tests in this study are really important and patients need to pay attention to the dietary and exercise guidelines provided by their study staff. And after the treatment period is over, um, the patients will uh, have a few more visits and then finally they'll have an opportunity to enroll in what's called an open label study and um, in this case, they will receive atrocentin in an unblinded fashion so that um, everyone has the opportunity to receive the drug. And, um, you know, as, as we've discussed, um, we're, we're implementing home health nurses or phlebotomists who are the blood drawers um, or vampires, as some people like to refer to them. Um, that is, uh, if that is preferred over a trip to the clinic. And we're exploring ways to get study drug and maybe even lab kits to the patient's homes and then how to get those lab specimens back to the main lab via couriers such as FedEx or as Alan likes to call the rideshare company Uber P. <laughs> um, we have a portal um, that can be accessed by patients and the study staff via a mobile phone or other devices for telemedicine, um, electronic consent, these study questionnaires, the pill diaries, and scheduling reminders for upcoming, visit, upcoming visits. Um, this portal is called Study Hub, and it is truly a central location where a lot of information about the study can be accessed. It's been really uh, fun to explore relatively new technology that bring the research closer to the patients. So we hope that this looks like progress to you and we're hoping uh, to hear from you about ways we can maybe do better. And we're, we are so thrilled to have been able to bring you this information. Um, and so maybe while the moderator is collating comments and questions, I, I think I see one at least, we can pull up our brand new website. This is hot off the presses um, and we'll see if we can make that work. Um, and so if you want more information about this study, there it is, hot off the presses. Um, and if you'd like to be contacted when the study opens um, closer uh, towards the end of the year, you can go to alignstudy.com and enter your contact information and we will follow up with you later in the year. So there's our website. There's several ways you can click and, and have a, um, uh, contact information sheet pop up and you can fill in your name and uh, somebody from one of our affiliates will be in touch with you, um, like I said, closer to the end of the year. So I think that's it for our presentation. Great, Megan, thank you so much. Alan, we have a question from the audience that may be for you. Um, does the study have a minimum GFR? Yeah, yeah, so the study, uh, the minimum GFR for the study is 30, and there's no maxima. And then we have one more question. Does the patient find out at the end of the trial if they received the real drug or the placebo? That is the ever perpetual question for blinded trials. It's a really good question, and uh, I, I, I think we, 
are very interested in finding out the best way that we can do that because we want patients to know eventually it's going to it will take years you know we to follow all 320 patients through two and a half years of treatment and then um, probably make our submission to the regulatory authorities and um, and and uh, maybe look at that afterwards i don't know alan if you have a different or a better answer to that yeah i mean i think i think you're you're right megan the, the challenge is that we you know while the study is ongoing it's really important that everybody remains blinded the good news is that with the open label extension at the end of the study everybody will have the opportunity regardless of whether they receive the active drug or placebo to be in the open label extension and receive active drug for sure so everyone eventually will get active drug if they want to if they choose to participate yeah and will uh, post transplant patients be eligible to use the drug so we're so we're we're not uh, studying post transplant patients in this in this particular study. Um, you know, one, one of the, the the reasons is that typically, you know, transplant patients are require immunosuppressive therapy, which we don't allow in the study. It is something that we could potentially look at later. We're we're thinking about a lot of ideas for other studies for atrocentin both in IG nephropathy and different populations that wouldn't be included in this study. So in people that would be excluded from this study for one reason or another, and in other types of kidney disease as well. Great, well, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, really would like to thank Chinook for their uh, financial support of our foundation. It's, it, it's very meaningful for us and it's, 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 it's great what you guys were able to do. And in addition to that, you work on your clinical trials really gives our patients a lot of hope that there may be somewhere down the line um, a little bit of relief for the people who have our disease. So thank you so much for everything you guys are doing. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting us. And then I also would like to thank Dr. Hassel again for his participation. It was a great presentation and really informative. And um, if anybody has any additional questions, you can either post them on the chat board or contact Terry or Bonnie and we'll pass those along to Dr. Hassel. Um, next week, our uh, presentation will be on becoming your own kidney advocacy. Hopefully, you can join us for that. Um, you can find more details about SPARC uh, on our website, www.igan.org backslash SPARC 2020. And we hope to see you guys again next week. Thanks again for everybody who joined us. Hi, thank you. Thank you guys so much. So great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Think that went well. That was awesome. Yeah, that oh my gosh, you guys, that was so great. I'm so excited. Dr. Hassler, I took um a couple of pictures of a couple of questions that we didn't get to with you, so I'll shoot them to you via email. It's fine. Um, and yeah. then I'll just email it out to everyone that was on tonight. I have the list. So yeah, um, that's fine. Let me know. I realized I also didn't like what Stuart had asked. Usually IGA patients, even when it recurs after transplant, don't need anything more than the regular transplant immunosuppression. The well, that's, that's ever, usually what they give us in the beginning, too. Yeah. And that's what my, yeah. yeah. And, and the only time I've ever really seen it be an issue is when they stop taking the immunosuppression for whatever reason. You know, a lot of times, i got to be honest, it's because they lose. Daddy. They lose insurance. Yeah. Yep, yeah. it's the money, honey. Um, Sorry, that's my daughter no. that was in the Pikachu <gasps> hat. She Hi. was outraged that I would Use her an example of coloring with pink so haphazardly. On oh, no. I never scribble, scribble anymore. I don't scribble, scribble. I bet you don't. You tell that daddy of yours. That's, that's, that's my pride nice. and joy right there. That's my pride and joy right there. Guys. Heck yeah, it is. And they grow so fast. How old is she? She's six. She'll be seven in, in October. Yeah, so mine was a year older. She was seven when she started presenting with her IGA and then was diagnosed oh, eight, oh. a week after her eighth birthday. Yeah, so I remember those days and they're just so wonderful. And now she's 16 and either hates me or is my best friend. It just depends on the day. <laughs> well, like I said, Carrie, if you want to talk just about about her stuff and possibly yeah. another biopsy, just let me know. You've got my number. I will. 
I will. I pulled it up again because I was looking at some of the um stuff that you were talking about at the end with the blood stuff, but um the the clotting and all that stuff, but it didn't seem Mama. so anyway, it looks good. We'll we'll talk, I'm sure. Yeah. And I'm just so thankful that you shared this with our people because okay. I'm telling you that they, they need this. Like it's amazing that the first time I could actually understand her biopsy was when we did our practice round. Like, are you kidding me? Uh. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You got the I diagnosis, heard. but you didn't understand what it meant. Yeah. Going so forward. I literally, while you were doing the practice round with us, pulled her biopsy report and went through it as you were talking. That's why I told everybody, I'm like, grab your biopsy reports because like doctors don't explain this stuff to us. They, but a, a lot not, of them not don't, normal speak. don't, a lot of them don't know it or, or you understand it themselves. So. Ah. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Cause it's, you know, I mean, I know it, it I mean, being considered a rare disease. No, we're not well, super rare I mean, in the glomerulonephritis stages, but yeah, I mean they they know it. But what they know is what they learn from their boards. You treat it with fish oil and an ACE inhibitor, or exactly. an carb if the cough comes, and that's it. That's it. They can't remember the exact path of physiological mechanism. They can't remember what it looks like, except that on immunofluorescence, IgA is really positive uh, because that's <laughs> what they had to know for their boards. Yeah. So. Well, we are so grateful that you brought this to the patients and you being a patient yourself really just helps so much for them to understand that, you know, what you're talking about, you, um, you know, you're here to help them. So I just love it. Thank you so much. And and we will definitely be in touch for more topics and such oh. in the future. Hopefully more. live spark Bye. next year. You can do a session too. I'm going to explain every bit of this again in live session at spark. My parents live in Nashville area. So. Yep. Yep. Daddy. yep. Well, Emily, it's nice to see you and finally put a face with the name and the email. So thank you for <laughs> nudging him along through all this. I know he's busy. I know you're busy too. <laughs> busy, <laughs> lazy. Happy to yeah. help. Daddy, where are you going? I know who runs the household. Don't worry. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Thanks, oh, Carrie. No. You guys did a great job tonight. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks, Natalie. I can't wait to hear about your August trip. I'm just, I was really expecting to hear next week and have the whole slide deck of photos ready for me. Okay, well, soon. And we'll we'll debrief in the next um, few days. Thanks so much again. Yeah, Bye, everyone. thanks. So, Emma, uh, so Natalie is um, circumventing Mount Rainier in Washington <gasps> by herself. She is, instead of climbing to the top, she's circling the whole mountain. Okay, I'm herself. a little jealous. I'm a That's little. That's what I said. I'm like, She's... I'm like, when you come home, I would like a slideshow of all the photos, and I would like every last detail. Oh, yeah, it's gonna be just gorgeous. I know, I know. So I'm so excited for her trip, but it's taken her years to get a permit to be able to do it. So. Oh wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So super cool. Yeah, we mm -hmm. got good people. Yeah, We're so I'm so glad we got connected to Me too. the foundation. Like it yeah. was, we loved the um, the uh, the dialogue last year and meeting. Every, oh man, it was just so great. We really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, that's what we were hoping to do this year, even better. But, right. You know, here we are. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how Jared's handling going going in every day. I had to take Lily for labs yesterday to to the hospital because um. She's a tough stick, so I have to take her strictly to the pediatric draws. Right. Um, and um, so, she, and she goes to Duke. So we walked in there, and that was the first time she's left the house since the end of February. And yep. I was really actually glad that she got to see it because she went, "Oh my gosh!" I mean, like they they shoot your head when you walk in to do the temperature, and they make you wash your hands and mask up. And she's like, "This is real." I'm like, "Yes, this is real. Yep. This is a thing." Like. This is why we're keeping you home so that we don't have to worry about all this. Yep. Mama, She's got a lily too. You are beautiful. What do you say? Thank you. You're so welcome. Daddy, Bye, when are you going to be home? I'm going to head home soon, baby girl. I promise. Oh, you're not even home. You're not even, you're at work. Oh, He's still at the hospital. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, you you go and you go home and you guys have a great night. I'm gonna go see my husband and daughter. And I will talk to you guys later. Okay, thank you so bye, much. Kate. All right, thank bye. you.
Bye, Daddy.